right, hello everybody. So we should be going live fairly soon here. And I'm just gonna wait for a little bit while uh, everybody kind of joins joins in. Um, might take a second. Looks like my presentation is messed up, but that's okay. Still waiting for people to join in. the notes. So uh, today we're going to be talking about machine learning and the Twitter API and a number of other different components that go into building uh, a serverless Twitter bot. Now I know you see some slides on the screen right now. That's just sort of to give you some context for who I am and what this presentation is about. We have in the Twitch chat the ability for you to ask whatever questions you want. So feel free to go ahead and uh, say who you are, say introduce yourself, say I'm watching from this country or, or I'm joining in from here or there or whatever. Uh, if you want an example of what we're building today, it looks a little bit like this. So you can go in to Twitter and you can say, hey, at WearML, I'd like to uh, find out where this picture is. So you post a picture from your camera roll. It doesn't ever have to have been on the internet before. And once you post it, a, the Twitter bot will receive it. It will go and talk to a couple of different AWS services, and then it will return and tell you where in the world it thinks that picture is. It will include a little static Google Maps image as well. So the way that this works architecturally is we have Twitter, and Twitter has their API. Now, their API has a subset of actions called webhooks. And webhooks are calls that Twitter makes on your behalf out to an endpoint that you're hosting, uh, which is typically a server. But in a serverless application, it's actually going to be a service called API Gateway that will take the webhook invocation from, uh, from, the tw from Twitter's API. It will hit that API Gateway endpoint and it will invoke a Lambda function. And a Lambda function is a serverless function that allows you to kind of write whatever code you want, do whatever you want. Now, that Lambda function subsequently will call the inference endpoint in Amazon SageMaker. And I'll jump into what Amazon SageMaker is at in depth in a little while. That's the machine learning part of all of this. The various subcomponents that go into this, we can dive deep on each one of those. But before we do that, I just, I'm curious if the people who are watching on the stream don't mind putting in chat, what's your experience with machine learning? Uh, how, how much of a primer do you need? Are you guys, do you consider yourselves AI experts or are you more learners and tinkerers? I'm happy to go into whatever depth you guys want. Uh, and let's see, Doug Toppin says, looking forward to learning some learning, uh, learning some <laughs> looking forward to some machine learning. We have uh, impryd 9 says hello from Auckland, New Zealand. Watchdrod says hi from Toronto. So, and then we have the, uh, the trolls on the stream. Thanks for joining. Uh, so anybody have any questions? Oh, you're saying that you are noobs, gotcha. So never done anything in practice. Okay, well let's, let's get some, let's kind of talk about this a bit. So I have some videos here that kind of help understand what machine learning is at its core. So AI is not new. It's actually been around probably for 70 plus years. And the way that this works is you, you have data or you have some kind of concept. And in the typical programmatic sense, you would have, you know, this data coming in, you would have a series of if statements or switch statements or something like that. And you would make some imperative determination about what should happen based on that incoming data. However, if you think about the way that your brain works, the way that your visual cortex works, you have your, you know, I, I'm looking at a screen right now. I'm looking at uh, a couple of different screens. And what's happening is the light from the screen is hitting my eye. It's going through my lens, it's hitting my retina, my retina is triggering my optic nerve and generating some electricity in my brain. And then inside of a part of my brain called the visual cortex, 
a series of connected neurons are going and firing off and coalescing into some concept. So when I see the screen in front of me, it coalesces into this concept of screen. But if we think about how that happens and how that model happens, uh, it's a lot easier if we kind of break it down into a smaller sample than just this kind of object detection that I'm talking about right now with screens. So let's take the example of a numbered data set, a handwritten digit. So this is called the MNIST data set, and it's a very, very common data set to start with. And the way that it works is you have this neuronal network, this neural network modeled after the visual cortex of individual neurons and fully connected layers. And you are connecting all of these and you're having an activation bias for each one of these individual kind of neurons. Now, you have several layers within this network. And when we talk about deep learning, what we're talking about is having many, 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 many layers and lots more data. This network that we're training today is actually, I wouldn't consider it deep, deep learning. It's just a simple, uh, fully connected network. So you see we have these 784 neurons coming in. That's going into a layer of 16, followed by another layer of 16. And in the process of training our model, what we're doing is we are just finding the correct weights and biases in order to trigger these different neurons. If that doesn't make sense, let's look at an example. So let's take uh, the numbers here. And what we're gonna do is is a 28 pixel by 28 pixel image. So we're going to break that down into uh, the various subcomponents. So this is the number eight, and we've broken that down into each of the 784 pixels. And then we're going and we're firing off and we're saying, okay, these neurons are lighting up, these neurons are lighting up. And the final layer, that output layer, often called like a softmax layer or something, is going to say, this is a number eight. And I will confidently state that. So when you're doing machine learning, all you're really doing is just trying to identify what these weights and biases need to be. And there are a couple different processes by which you can do that. And the, the very common one is a process called backpropagation. And the way that that works is you, you start out with kind of randomly initialized variables and values. And you say, okay, well, I put in this pixel uh, or th this, this number, and I know that this number is a nine. But my network, with its randomly initiated uh, weights and biases, told me that it was a number four. So I need to go backwards and calculate what the error function is, what the how far off I was from the uh, the answer I desired, and I need to adjust the weights and biases uh, across the network in order to do that. Now you don't typically do this for and for a single um, pardon me. You don't typically do this for a single image. You know, when you're training in networks like this, you're typically doing this for batches of images. So, you know, 10 at a time, 100 at a time, 1,000 at a time. And the reason that you do this in batches is that you want to try to save on some of the computational complexity involved in backpropagating all of this data and doing all of this, uh, uh, all of these calculations. And so we have some people joining in. Thanks for joining, everybody. Uh, Thanks for coming in from Brisbane, Australia, uh, Seth the Trader. And the Smasher says that the volume is a bit low. Let me see if I can turn this up a bit. Is that okay for everybody or did it get worse? Give me one second. Could be. Is this a little bit better, everybody? I'm gonna keep adjusting, I'm sorry about this. Keep adjusting. That is about as loud as I can make it go without also adding in uh, some static and stuff. Oh boy, I ruined everything now. So it's getting better, okay. I think that's the most that I can go without kind of messing with the uh, the audio more substantially. I'm doing a, another stream later today, so I'll try and get a bit better uh, during that time. So hopping back on track here. Uh, and then we have Chitnaya Chitta from India. Thanks for joining. 
this is what the the typical machine learning process looks like. If you you have these different layers that are kind of identifying different parts of the pixels that you're putting in, and then your intuition may say, okay, well maybe this is identifying the edges. You know, that would be what a convolutional neural network typically does is it defines these little kernels and it says, hey, I want to identify the different edges. And then maybe the second layer is calling out and uh, it's identifying that the number nine has a very long uh, straight mark and then a uh, circular part on top of that. And a question that's often posed is, does the network that you've trained actually do this? And in some cases, the answer is yes. But in many cases, the answer is we don't know. So Google has actually been working, well, some researchers at Google have actually been working on a series of different techniques for visualizing how networks learn and visualizing how these deep neural networks are interacting. And I think a number of those are pretty useful. So I'm gonna skip ahead a bit. Uh, let's, let's hop into some code. How does that sound? So uh, the first thing that we could do, and, and Bob Lukes asks, what's a good resource to start machine learning and deep learning? Many of the videos that I just showed you are not made by me. They're actually made by somebody named Grant Sanderson. And he has a YouTube channel called 3Blue1Brown. And he has a series on that YouTube channel called How Do Neural Networks Work? And I strongly suggest if you are a beginner and you're trying to learn more about machine learning, hopping over into that series because there's a lot of really good content there. And you can become an expert in machine learning over the course of maybe two or three hours, which is the most condensed course I have ever seen. And it's not really written like a course. It's not really written like a, a series of exams or anything like that. It's more written like a narrative. And there's a little bit of historical detail and then there's a little bit of math detail. And, and I'll write it here. It's called Three Blue, One brown and i sh just strongly recommend checking that channel out i've i've learned a lot from it not just in the space of uh not just in the space of the machine learning space you know there's a lot of good math on there too so um now that we have some people in the stream i'm going to ask the the interesting question of we're going to build a twitter bot today what do you want to call this Twitter bot? <laughs> so uh, in the past, when I've asked people to name these Twitter bots, I have gotten some interesting results. So Body McBotface is off the, off, the, uh, <laughs> off the table. And unfortunately, we can't allow anybody but the mods to post links. But if you want to send it to me in a DM, I'd be happy to post it for you, Seth the Trader. So does anybody have a name for this bot? that we're gonna to build today. Okay, it doesn't seem like we've got a name, so I'm just gonna call the bot um, Innovate Bot. So what I like to do when I'm getting started with things is I start up a Jupyter Notebook or a Jupyter Lab, and that's a really good kind of prototyping environment. Uh, and I'll open this in a new tab here. And the reason that I try and do most of my prototyping in a Jupyter Lab is even though I can open up a bunch of things in Vim and stuff like that, there is a uh, Amazon Web Service called SageMaker. And that service also lets me build these notebook instances that can have access to all of my data that's stored on AWS. So it typically uh, lets me take whatever I'm prototyping with locally, I can upload it to this notebook instance on SageMaker, and let's say my local machine doesn't have that much power, I can go to a notebook instance that's you know a P3-16x large or something like, absurd like that, and I can have these GPUs and other stuff available to me to run these uh, large computations. And then once I've figured out what exactly it is I wanna do on my, uh, on my bot and, and or you know with my model that I'm training and experimenting with I can go into the training service of SageMaker and the training service will actually run that training job for me completely serverlessly so I don't have to worry about any of the underlying infrastructure I don't have to maintain it and there's another subcomponent of that training called hyperparameter optimization and I think uh, my colleague Julian is going to talk about that 
a lot more. Then we get over to the inference side, and the inference side is what we're mostly going to be focusing on today with this bot. But uh, in the meantime, I'm going to create a notebook instance, just and it'll take a little bit to provision, but that's fine. We have our local notebook running as well. I'm just going to call this Hello Innovate, and I'm going to use a slightly larger than normal instance, uh, and I'm just going to create this. It'll run for a while, and then on my local machine, I'm going to start an instance. So let's talk about the Twitter API for a second. And Reynald Dobatak asks if the slides will be available. The slides are actually already online, and I'm happy to share them with anybody who is curious. So dev.twitter.com. And let's look at the APIs that we have available. So we have the direct messages API, uh, and this is going to allow us to send direct messages and, and do really whatever we want. And then we have the account activity API, uh, which is very similar to the direct messages API in the way that it works. And it works on a concept called webhooks. And what happens here is you provision an application and you take the credentials from that application, which are typically your application secret. It's, it's OAuth, if you've ever heard that term before. Uh, it's this application secret, this application access token, and uh, consumer key, and, and there are different names for the different subcomponents of how OAuth is um, implemented. And you're basically taking these various subcomponents and you're, you are using them to cryptographically sign or verify requests that are either coming to your app or requests that you were making back to Twitter. So the, the way that this works in practice is you can actually have people OAuth and, and authenticate into your application, and then you can make actions on their behalf as an application. So in this case, Twitter makes it very easy for you to provision an access token for just yourself, uh, and you don't need any kind of whitelisting or or additional review of the application in order to allow that. So what we've done is we've created this application where ML, and we're going to teach it to go and talk to uh, these various webhooks. Uh, and we may not finish this bot in the amount of time that we have. So if there is a section of this that you are more interested in seeing, uh, I can talk more about the machine learning side, or I can talk more about the serverless integration side. It's really up to you guys. So in the meantime, we're going to make use of another service. Oh, and this is already done provisioning, so I'll open that up. So we're going to make use of another service called Secrets Manager. And the reason we're going to use, and yes, the code is actually already available, uh, not this exact code that we're building today, but some code that we've built also on Twitch in the past. I can put, post the location to that right now. Um, so uh, I did allow Twitch to name the previous version of this code. So that is the code. I, I'm sorry, there's no readme or anything like that. I uh, but as you can see, we built this live on Twitch and we kind of thanked all the people who joined in. So, and it seems like we have one vote for the serverless integration side and hi, Dr. Wolf from Sydney. So the serverless integration side, we, we can start talking about that. Uh, the, the way that we're going to get access to our credentials here is we're going to use another AWS service called Credentials Manager. Now, Credentials Manager is, or, or sorry, we're going to use Secrets Manager. And Secrets Manager is a new service. Previously, prior to the release of Secrets Manager, I actually used uh, the, the parameter store. So if you go over to Systems Manager within AWS, there's another service called Parameter Store. And this is how. Uh, I used to store all of my various keys. However, Secrets Manager has a built-in rotation mechanism that's pretty powerful. And 
that rotation mechanism will actually allow me to write my own Lambda functions to go out to Twitter and refresh my tokens whenever they run out. So uh, if I want to use this, I kind of just need to use Bodo3. Bodo3 is the Python SDK. So Bodo is named after the Amazon River Boto Dolphin. And I, I didn't name it. I'm sorry, it wasn't me. So because it's the Amazon Web Services SDK. And what we're going to do is we're just going to say import Boto3. We're going to create a secrets manager object. So secrets equals Boto3.client secrets manager. And then I'm going to say region name equals uh, US West 2 because that's the region that I'm using today. And from there, I'll say secrets.get seek. Well, I don't actually remember what the API call is. So I'll just say secrets dot get secret value and then we'll say uh, secret well I, I also don't remember what the API parameter is so I'll just call out to help and I'll say secret ID is what I need so I will say secrets dot get secret secret value secrets ID equals and then we just as you saw before we have our ID here, so we can just copy this. And that's going to be my credentials to talk to Twitter. Um, creds. And of course, there was some sort of error. Secrets ID versus secret ID. Cool. So now we have my credentials. But in order to do things with those credentials, we need to uh, basically use the Python Twitter SDK. Luckily, I already have this installed. If you don't have this installed, you could run something simple like pip install uh, Python Twitter, and that would kind of get you off to the races. So uh, from here, I'll say import Twitter, and I'm going to basically need to unpack that dictionary that's returned from the secrets manager. Um, and I'm actually gonna do this off screen really fast just in case I accidentally expose my credentials. So I don't remember the exact invocation. So I'm just gonna make sure <laughs> that I have this right. Um, And I didn't, so I'm glad I did that off screen briefly. So we also are going to import uh, JSON here. And just to keep all of this a little bit easier to run, since there's no real cost in running all of this again, we'll do it like this. We'll put it all in that first one. And we'll say json.loadString. Uh, and this should load it as a dictionary. So now we have our credential string, and we really just want to unpack this. So I, I know that Twitter accepts the um, expects the input in a certain order, but I don't remember exactly what that order is. So I'm just going to go Python Twitter API and look up what the instantiation is. And if we go over here to getting started, we can see our little API keys and consumer key, consumer secret. And again, I just have to go off screen for one second to make sure I have the uh, right values here. So we have consumer key, consumer secret, access token, access token secret. We do indeed have the right values, excellent. So one of the cool things about Python is I can actually just have this uh, run and I can instantiate Twitter by saying Twitter equals, or sorry, I, I guess I need to import it, import Twitter and then I can say TAPI equals, um, I guess I should really call this like Twitter API equals uh, Twitter dot API and then I just unpack that creds object 
And of course, I spelled access token wrong. Did I? Let's see. Access token key is what it's called. So let me just, there's an easy way of fixing this, which is to hop over back into the secrets manager console and change it from access token to access token secret. Um, these are the, this is the fun of live coding, everybody. Uh, so let's change this to access token key. And then we can run this again. And we have our Twitter API. And just to verify that we have the right, you know, Twitter API, we can say verify credentials. And then we can say screen name. And our screen name is where I'm out. So we've got our bot working. So previously, Twitter had an API called the kind of user streams API. So you would go and you would say, you know, Twitter API dot get uh, user stream. And you would just have kind of a while loop where you were taking the results of Twitter stream and, and doing things with it. However, they've deprecated those APIs. They're going away in August. So now you have to use the Webhooks API. And the Webhooks API is actually much better for a serverless environment because it allows us to go uh, out to the AWS console, like API Gateway, and we can create our own little API here. So I can create a new API. I can call it where ML. So this is the Amazon API Gateway um, console. And we're just going to create a completely new API where ML uh, webhooks API. And we're going to define a new um, method. And this is just going to be any. And we're going to invoke a Lambda function with that. And we're going to make it a proxy invocation. Now, the proxy invocation is, there, there are two different ways of invoking Lambda. The first is to rely on some of the underlying parts of the API gateway to transform the incoming message. So the incoming message could, inv could be JSON, it could be binary, it could be whatever kind of data it is. We want to make sure that we are performing as much as possible outside of the Lambda function before we give it to the Lambda function so that the data is in the format we expect. Now, because of the way that the authentication and other various subcomponents of this Lambda work, uh, I'm gonna use a proxy invocation because sometimes we're gonna get a, an HTTP GET request, a capital G-E-T, and that GET request is going to ask us to uh, prove that we are who we say we are, that our webhook has the right credentials. And we're going to have to do some cryptographic signing and stuff just to make that work. And sometimes we're going to get a post request. And that post request is going to be uh, the same kind of style where we have to take the content, the body, out of the, out of the request. And we have to transform it and decode it from JSON and perhaps also unencrypt it. And the advantage of the proxy integration is that rather than having to define this as two completely separate components, I can kind of keep the related cryptographic stuff inside. Um, that said, I, there are also advantages to defining the, the individual methods, but we'll just do this for now. Um, but I don't have a Lambda function yet. So before I can even go and build all of this, I'm gonna go and make a Lambda function. So, I'm just gonna do this right here in the console. And let's say, create a new function. Uh, and we'll just call this where ML invoker. And we're gonna do this in Python. And we're gonna use Python 3 because we are modern and good. And we're just gonna use an existing uh, role that I have for my Lambda functions. Um, so we've created the function. 
it's loading. Loading, loading, loading. I'm going to refresh because it normally is ready instantaneously and doesn't need any of this. And I'm actually going to go ahead and bump this all the way up to 3 gigs, and I'm going to set the timeout to 30 seconds. So the, the function is actually ready to go. It's just this editor that's not loading. Um, I don't know why. But it doesn't matter. We can hop back over to API Gateway. We can take our any method. We can take our proxy invocation. And we can say we want to use WearML Invoker. So I'll click Save. OK. And now we have a, an API gateway. So I think if we test this, it should just kind of return. And we got an internal server error, of course. That's because we're not returning our stuff in the right format. There we go. So the format that uh, is expected from a proxy invocation is actually something like this. So it's supposed to be return status code uh, and then, you know, is it a 200 or a 400 or whatever? In this case, we're just going to say 200. Uh, and then we're going to have our body. And our body, in this case, is going to be. Um, and one of my favorite parts of this is that it supports um, it supports Vim mode in this new editor. So you can press escape, and you, you immediately have Vim mode enabled, uh, even with like little macro recording and stuff, too. But that's the super nerdy stuff. And we're just going to say hello world to start. And we'll click save. And uh, we'll test this again. And you can see we got back this result. So it is working. Now we need to deploy this. And given that we are developers, we're definitely going to just deploy to prod. So production, yay. Don't ever deploy directly to prod. So we'll deploy this. And you can see we get this handy dandy URL. And if we invoke it, we get this little endpoint. So uh, you can even curl this. You can say curl. Da -da -da, and we get this hello world. And you guys are welcome to try that out. Um, and there's all kinds of good little controls we can put in place. Like we can enable throttling. So no more than you know 1,000 requests per second. I'm actually going to bring this down to like 1,000 and burst of 2,000. Uh, save those changes. And we can enable a cache, and that cache will provision uh, an elastic cache storage, uh, memcached e instance for me, all kinds of really good stuff. We can even set stage-specific variables. So if we were in dev, we could say we want to set our log level to debug. If we were in uh, production, we could say our, our log level is error, all that good stuff. And we can hop over the dashboard, and we can see the number of API calls that are coming in. Very good, very cool, useful service. Now, what we want to do is we want to tell Twitter to invoke this endpoint whenever something happens. But before we can do that, we're going to need a little bit more I, uh, context and content in order to be able to correctly sign these messages that are going to come in. So we have to go back to Twitter, and we have to look and see what a webhook looks like. So if we hop over to Guides, uh, we can see Getting Started with Webhooks. And it says, you know, you apply for your developer account and do all of this stuff, which we've already done. And now I know that I need to call out to this webhook URL, webhooks JSON URL. Uh, and then I need to work on securing the webhook. So to secure the webhook, I have to do a challenge response check. And this is going to take the um, the tokens the credit from the credentials that I had earlier, and it's going to use them to cryptographically sign the response. Uh, and the amusing thing is there's actually code that, <laughs> that I wrote <laughs> a long time ago. Uh, this API is kind of old. So let's go over here. And we want to define a method sign CRC. 
uh, CRC, we're gonna say, uh, and we're gonna need to import a couple of tools here. We're gonna need to import HMAC. And I mean, the, a lot of this is outlined right here. Um, so we could kind of start from this if we wanted to, uh, but we're gonna change it slightly. So we'll insert a cell below. Um, we're gonna have this method, import base 64, import JSON. Uh, well, we're, we're already gonna have JSON available to us. And we're gonna say sign CRC. So what we wanna do is we wanna take those credentials that we had earlier, and we wanna grab the consumer secret. Then from the input, we want to say, you know, the, the, the CRC is something that we're going to extract from the, uh, from the incoming request. And two, two, two bad C's asks, uh, can you install any Python 3.6 packages in there? You absolutely can. Um, there are two ways of deploying Lambda functions. The first is to do the, the method that I, I most commonly do, which is just kind of zip it up locally. Uh, and the second is to use Cloud9 and Sam and say, hey, I want you to pull down all of my dependencies for me and just build it and, and deploy it. Um, I'll probably not be doing it that way today though. Uh, and we don't have a ton of time left. I think in fact, we only have about uh, 10 minutes left. Just give me one second here. Um, Let me see, what time is this supposed to end? 5.40, so we have about 20 minutes left. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna speed up a little bit. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna go quite a bit faster now just to try and get everything done. So we're gonna say that we're gonna have our hash and we're gonna say hmac.new um, and we're gonna convert this into bytes. We're gonna say we want our, uh, our consumer secret here. Ba -ba -ba. And this HMAC is just a method of signing a request. So we're gonna grab this. And then the other thing that we need to do is we actually need to convert, um, we need to tell the, the byte encoder that we're calling here how to convert the input because strings in Python are, um, uh, in Python 3 are Unicode by default. And the HMAC encoder for some reason doesn't accept that. And then we're gonna say digest mod equals, and this is where we need to import um, SHA-256 from hashlib. So we're gonna say import hashlib. Uh, so we'll say from hashlib import SHA-256. Da -da -da -da. And SHA-256 is gonna be our, our means of encrypting. And you can see this is really just the exact same as what's, what's happening below. Uh, we're just doing it in a better way than the sample code was. Um, and from there, we have our HMAC. So this is the hash that we need. And we just need to return that signed message. So um, from, sorry, we can return this as a string or we can return it really however we want. Um, I'm gonna return it as a JSON string. Uh, so we're gonna say the response token is going to be, and then we'll put uh, SHA-256 equals in front of this just to comply with what Twitter is asking us to do here. If we hop over to securing webhooks, it should tell us uh, what it's supposed to look like. Uh, where were we? So we're gonna say SHA-256 plus uh, base64. Uh, so we'll say from base64 import b64 encode, uh, b64 encode. Um, we'll get to grab the digest of that thing that we just created and uh, we'll call decode and that'll turn this uh, base64 object into a string. Pretty straightforward. So then if we call sign CRC, sign CRC, blah, blah, blah. 
we get our little response token, uh, which we can use and send that back to Twitter, uh, which is the first part of creating our webhook. So we can kind of copy all of this and put it into our Lambda function. So we can say API gateway, da, da, da. sorry, we're going to need I'm going to need all of this as well. So I'm going to clean this up over in the Lambda function now. Don't really need Twitter. And we don't need to specify the region since we are already in US West 2. Although, you know, sometimes explicitly stating the region is better than not explicitly stating it. Uh, and then this is all we need to do in order to verify the webhook. So, uh, uh, you know, we could define another method, which is verify request, uh, which I, I suppose we could do that now. Uh, it's really just the exact same process that we've done here with sign CRC, except in reverse. So we're being given the CRC and we're decrypting it, which is the code that you see here. Um, so instead of consumer secret, I'm going to say creds, consumer secret. Uh, and just to check that all of this kind of is syntactically correct, I'm going to go down here and... Let's see. Oh, yep. Well, it doesn't have the right region. Uh, and Mr. Robot asks if this will be available later. It should be, yes. Uh, and I'm going to be doing a, another session later tonight. I'm, I'm just coming off of a, a very long flight, and I haven't slept in about 40 hours or so. So later tonight, I might be a little bit more on my game and stop making so many uh, mistakes. So... Uh, the next thing that we want to do is we want to kind of figure out how to parse the incoming event. So we can say that if this event .get path is going to be, uh, you, you know, maybe maybe we have um, is webhook, then you know do the right thing, return. Uh, actually, it's probably better to set this up as a negative. It's probably better to say if event.getPath does not equal webhook, then we want to return like a 404 or something. Return uh, st status code 404 and body equals this path is not valid or something like that. Now... Uh, what we want to do is if the event dot get HTTP method equals equals get, and so if it's a get request as opposed to some other kind of request, then we know that the CRC is going to be event dot get uh, query string parameter string. I got it. I cannot spell this to save my life. Query string parameters. And we'll we'll populate this with an empty dictionary just in case we don't have the right thing here. Uh, CRC token. Uh, and if not, sorry, if not CRC, then we want to return again a status code five hundred. We'll say four hundred one, and um, the body will be. Oh, scroll up. Sorry, guys. Is this better? Sorry about that. We're going to say, uh, let me actually adjust this screen a little bit. I'll turn off the um, image. That should make it a little bit easier to see. And I can also make it bigger. So uh, from it's nice that you guys said something in chat, because it makes me feel like somebody's watching. And we'll just say CRC not provided or invalid. Um, and then. We return uh, status code 200 and body sign CRC and that CRC that we just kind of took out. Now, if you're asking uh, how exactly we're supposed to grab this and, and do stuff with it, uh, one, of the, one of the frustrating parts of Python is that there's no kind of 
boundary. So you have to rely on white space here to know exactly what's happening. So, you know, I could probably make this a little bit easier to read if I threw an else in here. Uh, and I said, hey, let me do it like this. But it, it's not the most Pythonic thing in the world to do that. So we're going to keep it the, the way that it is. And we're going to say, you know, return this status code, 200 body, whatever. So that's going to call out to our CRC function, which is going to say, hey, uh, calculate this HMAC and return. And that is all that we need in order to sign up a webhook to do stuff uh, for this function. Now, given the amount of time that we have left, I don't want to replace the existing working webhook on the WearML bot with this one, just because we haven't really implemented the machine learning side of this algorithm yet. So I have about 10 minutes left, and I'm going to use those 10 minutes to hop into how the machine learning side of this bot works. So uh, I'm going to skip over most of the SageMaker part here. Uh, sorry, lots of slides. OK, so the, the goal of this bot was to be able to identify where in the world the picture was based on the pixels in the image alone and nothing more. Now, that is a hard concept, right? Uh, typically, photos are posted with metadata. They're posted with um, something called EXIF data that contains latitude and longitude. Now, there's a data set uh, that's hosted in the AWS public data sets repo. I'll show you this now. So I'll show you the public data sets. If you'll excuse me for just one second, I'm gonna, yes, I will definitely provide the slides. So if we look for the multimedia commons data set, this is a collection of a, uh, more than 100 million Creative Commons licensed Flickr images and videos. So this is a huge, huge, huge data set, 100 million different image files and video files. Uh, the videos add up to around 8,000 hours of video with an average video length of 37 and a medium vid median video length of 28 seconds. So that's 99 million image files. And of those 99 million, many of them contain EXIF data. So they contain the, the data that we need in order to be able to uh, create this machine learning network. So some researchers, at, some researchers at Berkeley, not me, uh, they took the 33.9 million images from that data set and they built on top of an existing image recognition classification network called ResNet. And it's a very, ResNet was originally created back in, I think, 2015 by Microsoft Research. They took that ResNet architecture, which was originally designed to identify you know, whether or not it was a picture of a dog or whether or not it was a picture of a cat or a picture of a bicycle or a picture of uh, a whiteboard or a microphone, anything like that. It, they took that same network and they took out the very last layer of the network. So instead of being a classification layer for objects, they replaced it with a geometrical classification layer. And so that they provided 15,527 different uh, classifications. And they took those 33.9 million geotagged images and they just iterated over them and figured out where in that 15,527 uh, set of classifications each image belonged. And they were able to train the network that way. And that took about nine days on a single P216X large. And the, the resulting model was around 280 megabytes. Now, on a P316X large and on a machine where you can actually, uh, or, or in a framework where you can actually go and spread that training job out, I've actually been able to train for more epochs and uh, converge a little bit faster parallel in only one day. So I'm able to train the exact same amount of data and everything in one single day, which is kind of cool. 
Uh, and just in case you've never seen what the ResNet architecture looks like before, it's really straightforward. I'm sure everyone understands this and doesn't really need me to explain it. Makes sense, right? Makes perfect sense. It seems like there's a lot of stuff happening. The thing that ResNet does is it kind of has a cheat code. So what Microsoft Research proposed, and you know there were these people working at Microsoft Research, um, what they proposed was instead of having layer after layer after layer after layer uh, go through and, and propagate its results to the next layer, they built in a cheat code in some of the layers that says if the signal is strong enough, we actually want to propagate over to this other channel and come over outside of the, the existing flow of the network and go down into a layer where we know that this signal will be relevant. Now, the reason that you do that is that the more layers that you add to these networks, the more you suffer from uh, loss. So the output signal, the error function that you calculate between your, your, your given results in the network and the result that you wanted, that error becomes harder and harder to propagate and it, backwards. It, it's harder to get that back to the neurons that matter and say, hey, this is what we need to do. So uh, what the Planet paper did, and this was uh, from Google Research, they, they came up with this idea is they took the S2 multi-scale partitioning library and they um, went through all of this and they basically split the earth into thousands and thousands of different little cells. So if you look at the places that are very densely populated, you'll see that there are a lot more cells there. Now, the reason that that happens is the way they calculated this index was they actually took the existing data set of those 33 million uh, images and they, they used a piece of fractal geometry called the Hilbert curve to figure out how dense each region needed to be based on the number of uh, images that were in that region. So this allows them to represent the space available in a very, very small way. Um, so this is what a Hilbert curve looks like if you've never seen one before. Um, I don't know why it's not playing. Is there a way to play this? Let me see if I can find um, Hilbert curve animation. Just gonna see if I can find this really, really quickly. I only have about five minutes left, everybody. Uh, so this is how a Hilbert curve works. So you start out like this, and then you repeat that step and you go into the same number of points. Now, this has a really, really cool feature in that it allows you to go from uh, two dimensions into one dimension while preserving locality. So you can preserve the locality of X and Y coordinates in a number line uh, through this kind of compression algorithm, or not compression algorithm, but this piece of fractal geometry. So you can see it repeated time and time again. Pretty cool. And so that is what this uh, animation is supposed to show. Now, the advantage of using something like ResNet and a classification layer at the end is that the resulting model is actually quite small. So the, the model that Google proposed with their planet paper was on the order of 20 gigs and it did not have the best performance. Now, I, I'm not trying to like beat on Google or anything. It's, it's still a really brilliant idea. So uh, their work is what allowed this later work to happen. But uh, the, the 20 gigabyte model means it's not something you could host in a Lambda function, right? It's kind of, uh, it's a big and expensive thing that you would have to run a big server. So the advantage of having a much smaller model, the 300 megabyte model from that ResNet network is that the inferences are faster, you don't have to go through as much data, and you get, uh, in fact, better performance. So not only can you train it faster, you can also get uh, better performance at inference runtime. So uh, again, the way that this works is we have Twitter calling out to API Gateway, calling out to Lambda function, calling out to the SageMaker inference endpoint, and I've only got a few minutes left, so I'm just gonna skip through here. This is all the code. Okay, so how do we load the model in? The way that we load the model in is we import MXNet and then we load the model. 
Now, SageMaker, when you bring your own model, is going to kind of populate a bunch of different environment variables for me. So this model name part is going to be populated for me as an environment variable, and I'll load that in. And then I'm going to bind that model to, uh, you know, I can just show this in the code. It's a little bit easier to see from there. Uh, predict. So you can see here, I'm loading the model path and the model name. Um, and this is the uh, ResNet 101, pre-trained, all that good stuff. Uh, now I'm loading the 12th epoch of this model. And I'm saying I want to bind this to the CPU. Now, once I've bound this to the CPU, I need to provide the parameters, so the input shape, the shape of the data that I'm going to be taking in. And this is going to be uh, 224 by 224 pixels uh, image, and it's going to be um, grayscale. Or I think it's actually going to be RGB. I can't remember. So uh, we set some parameters, and these are just the parameters that we've loaded in from this load. And then we do uh, meaning the image, and this is just taking the mean of all the different images and kind of making it easier for the network to train that way if you have a bunch of images that are really, really black and a bunch of images that are really, really yellow, uh, you're not you know, mistakenly uh, throwing those images into the wrong place. Then you create a batch, uh, and then you open this grids text.file. Now that grids text.file, if I open this really quickly, Um, this, as you can see, is just, it's basically a CSV. So all it's saying is I have a couple of different IDs and this is the starting bounding box and that's the ending bounding box for every single one of these. So that is what that multi-scale architecture was that we were talking about before. So we can go over to, uh, what was that other file we had open? We can go and we can load this in uh, and it's only about one meg, that whole file. And then we do some pre-processing on the image. And this just says if the image is in portrait mode or it's in landscape mode, we want to kind of crop it towards this 224 by 224 uh, section. So that's, all, you know, it, it might seem like some complicated math is happening here, but all we're really doing is we're just applying that mean image, that, that recolorizing that we needed to do to the image, and we're transforming it to the size that we want. Uh, and then in order to call the prediction, all we have to do is take that network and forward propagate that batch, that batch of one image, we just have to say, hey, give us the output. Now that output is going to give us 15,000 different answers, or 15,527 different answers. And all we want to do is we want to sort by the probability of each of those answers, because we're basically taking the entire end layer of the network and we're saying, hey, what are the results? So we only really care about uh, the max predictions, which I think in this case I set to 20 or 3 or something. So we want the first three predictions organized by probability, and we want to return those results. And then we do a little bit of stuff with um, enriching the data, putting emojis on it, and all that good stuff. So uh, if you want to see an example of this, you just sort of hop over to twitter.com slash where ml, and uh, you will see it Oops, sorry, that was Twitch, sorry. Twitter.com slash wearml. And this is the end of my presentation because you're gonna hear from one of my colleagues next. And what happens here is uh, someone posts something. So uh, someone posts an image like this and it'll tell you where in the world it is. So why is it posting the same one again? Um, is a picture of Vancouver, British Columbia, so it's showing Vancouver. And we put emojis in there just to um, keep the millennials happy. So someone posts a picture of this castle and it figures it's in Nuremberg. So that is how the bot works. Uh, I know that we didn't cover all of the various components in depth. I will post all of the relevant content into this. But next you're gonna hear from a colleague of mine called Gabe, and he's going to walk through AppSync and some of the other cool stuff that people are building on top of it. So thank you all for joining. Uh, I'll be around a little bit later today as well. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this presentation and I will see you next time.